Hello, this is Jorge Cortez from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Welcome to this educational activity on the management of CML. The following audio is from a three-part presentation with Dr. Jorge E. Cortez. This audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Faster, Better, Safer, Getting CML Treatment Right, How to Enhance Outcomes with Precision Medicine in the TKI Era. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash AWF. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. What I'd like to discuss today is some of the evidence that has led us to where we are now in the treatment of CML, and how we can use these data to make the best treatment choices for our patients. As many of you know, the emergence of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs, in the early 2000s not only gave us more targeted treatment options, but helped improve the clinical outcomes for our patients. Previously, CML management had been characterized by several more conventional options, including hydroxyurea, interferon, and stem cell transplantation. On this slide, you can see how the use of the first-generation TKI, imatinib, was able to improve outcomes in patients. The slide shows the poor outcome with treatments such as hydroxyurea and busulfan, with a significant improvement in survival once we started introducing interferon and stem cell transplant, but really a significant benefit once imatinib came into the picture with a survival range over 90% at five to six years. So in many ways, TKI therapy has changed the natural history of the disease, which previously was an indolent but inevitably fatal disease. The excellent outcomes we saw with imatinib have also been seen with second-generation TKIs, which were first validated in the second-line setting. Subsequently, these agents were tested in newly diagnosed patients where excellent outcomes were once again observed. This slide shows a summary of the results of the main studies of the drugs that are currently approved for frontline therapy with tyrosine kinase inhibitors in CML. You see high rates of complete cytogenetic response by 12 months with imatinib, but higher with dasatinib or nilotinib. And the same can be said with even bigger differences for major molecular response at 12 months. There was a trial with bosutinib, which was negative in terms of complete cytogenetic response by 12 months, but ongoing studies are reassessing this. These agents, which are more potent than imatinib, include dasatinib and nilotinib. As mentioned, bosutinib, although the BELLA trial was negative, has an ongoing study called the BEFORE trial, which is testing a different dose of bosutinib, a lower dose, versus imatinib in newly diagnosed patients with chronic phase CML. As we develop more experience with TKI therapy in CML, the more apparent it became the different levels of response were associated with different outcomes. It is useful then to have agreed upon definitions of response in order to help guide our ability to assess the success or failure of therapy. There are several categories of response that we need to get familiar with. A complete hematologic response essentially means normalization of the peripheral blood with normal white cell count, normal platelets, no immature cells, and no signs or symptoms of the disease. A cytogenetic response is based on the number of metaphases that have Philadelphia chromosome, which could be none, which will define a complete cytogenetic response, up to 35% for a partial cytogenetic response, more than 35% with a minor cytogenetic response. In the old days, we would refer to complete cytogenetic response and partial cytogenetic response together as a major cytogenetic response. Here we can see the definitions for molecular response. We refer to early molecular response to BCR-able transcripts of 10% or less in the international scale, usually at three months or at six months. A major molecular response refers to BCR-able transcripts of 1% or less, again by the international scale. And this is equivalent to a three-log reduction from a standardized baseline at the PCR. Deeper responses we call as MR4 when it's approximately a four-log reduction or more, and that'll be in the international scale as 0.01% or less. 
And the deepest molecular response, which is the MR 4.5, or 4.5 log reduction from the standardized baseline, is equivalent to 0.0032% in the international scale. When the transcript levels are undetectable, we sometimes refer to that as complete molecular response. This is a little difficult to define because the sensitivity of the assays may vary from one laboratory to the other, so that one is not very well standardized in general. Now that we have reviewed the definitions of response, let's turn to a discussion of timing. In other words, does achieving an early response matter? A great deal of evidence shows that achieving an earlier or faster response is an important predictor of outcome. Jane and colleagues, for example, assess the effect of early responses with TKIs on outcome in patients with newly diagnosed chronic phase CML. Among 483 patients who were treated as initial therapy with either 400 milligrams of imatinib, the standard dose, or a higher dose of imatinib, 800 milligrams, or with nilotinib, or with dasatinib, and with a median follow-up of 72 months, a landmark analysis of three months by molecular response showed that the three-year event-free survival for the patients that at three months had a transcript level of 1% or less was 95%. If it is 1% to 10%, it was 98%. But if it was more than 10%, it was only 61%. And this is a very significant, statistically different uh, response. So in these curves, you can see uh, in the upper panel the difference in event-free survival at three months at the top and by uh, six months in the two uh, curves. And on the left, you see them by cytogenetic analysis, and on the right, by molecular analysis. And that is important because essentially, a 10% PCR value corresponds to a major cytogenetic response. So if you're less than a 10%, means that you have achieved a partial cytogenetic response at least. Next, I will explore some of the important studies that have tested second-generation TKIs in the frontline setting. Welcome back. As noted before, several major studies have validated TKIs in newly diagnosed patients with chronic phase CML. These include the IRIS study, which established the first-generation agent, imatinib mesylate, as an effective frontline option. In the next few minutes, I am going to concentrate on the latest evidence of major trials testing the frontline use of second-generation TKIs, such as dasatinib and nilotinib, as well as more recently investigated agents such as basutinib. In the decision trial, randomized phase three compared the satinib 100 milligrams once daily with the matinib 400 milligrams once daily, all of these in patients with newly diagnosed chronic phase chronic myeloid leukemia. In the initial results, the satinib induced a significantly higher and faster rate of responses. For example, the rate of complete cytogenetic response was 77% with the satinib compared to 66% with imatinib. And the rate of major molecular response was 46% with asatinib and 28% with imatinib. The responses were achieved in a significantly shorter time with asatinib than with imatinib. At three years, the median time to complete cytogenetic response was three versus six months with asatinib versus imatinib. And at three and six months, the proportion of patients with bcr able transcript levels equal or less than 10%, or what we call early molecular responses, was significantly higher in the dasatinib arm. The final five-year results from the study are now available. At the time of the study closure, 61% and 63% of dasatinib and imatinib-treated patients remained on the initial therapy, respectively. However, the cumulative rates of MMR and molecular responses with a 4 and 4.5 log reduction in transcript levels from baseline by five years remain significantly higher for dasatinib versus imatinib. This slide, for example, shows the cumulative rate of major molecular response for dasatinib and imatinib. And as you can see, by five years, 
it is 76% with dasatinib and 64% with imatinib. The curves remain separated from the beginning of the analysis, for example, at 12 months, and the same separation appears to remain by the five-year cutoff. Similar outcomes were noted when assessing molecular responses at important type points, such as three months. Substantially more patients treated with dasatinib achieved BCR able less than 10% at three months early molecular response. This was 84% with dasatinib and 64% with imatinib. When you see these results, you see that the patients that achieved the less than 10% transcripts at three months have a significantly better probability of eventually achieving a complete cytogenetic response, which is over 90%, compared to those patients that had more than 10% transcripts at three months, which is somewhere between 40 to 59% probability of ever achieving a complete cytogenetic response. The same can be said for the deeper responses. Patients that achieve the lower transcript levels have a much better chance of achieving a major molecular response, which is over 80%, than the patients that have more than 10% transcripts at three months, who only have about a 40% probability of ever achieving a major molecular response. And the deepest response, MR 4.5, about half of the patients who get to less than 10% ever achieve an MR 4.5, whereas only 5 to 12% of patients that are more than 10% uh, transcripts at three months ever will achieve these deeper responses, emphasizing the importance of these early molecular responses. For the overall study, the rates of progression-free and overall survival at five years remained high and similar across treatment arms. The patients that have 10% transcripts or less at three months have a more than 90% probability of being alive at five years, compared to only about 80% of patients of those that had higher transcript levels at three months. Similarly, for progression-free survival, those with the lower transcript levels had a much better probability of progression-free survival at five years, closer to 90%, compared to those patients with more than 10% transcripts at three months, where only 72% of patients were alive and free of progression. And the probability of being transformation-free at five years is also significantly better, 97% for those with the lower transcript levels at three months, and only about 80% for the patients with the higher transcript levels at three months. In conclusion, the five-year follow-up of the decision study demonstrates that there are deeper molecular responses with dasatinib compared to imatinib, and there are more optimal molecular responses with dasatinib compared to imatinib. This, however, has not yet translated into significant differences in transformation-free or overall survival. However, the achievement of BCR-able transcripts of 10% or less at three months is associated with significantly higher probability of progression-free survival and overall survival by five years. And this goal, the BCR-able transcripts of 10% or less at three months, is achieved significantly more frequently with the satinib, 84%, than with imatinib, 64%. Also importantly, by five years, 42% of patients treated with dasatinib had achieved an MR 4.5, and this is significantly higher compared to imatinib. Recently, we have also seen updated five-year results from a study testing nilotinib in chronic phase CML, the NST-ND trial. Earlier results from this trial show that nilotinib, either 300 milligrams twice daily or 400 milligrams twice daily, resulted in earlier and higher response rates and a lower risk of progression to accelerated or blast phase than imatinib at the standard dose of 400 milligrams daily. Nilotinib at 300 milligrams daily, which is the standard dose in frontline, resulted in a 12-month probability of major molecular response of 44% and at 400 milligrams twice daily of 43% compared to imatinib, which gave only 22% probability of major molecular response at 12 months. Let's take a look at the five-year data for the NSTND trial. In the recent update, nearly 80% of patients in each nilotinib arm achieve an MMR, compared to 60% for the imatinib-treated patients. Here you can see this increased 
probability of achieving a major molecular response for the nilotinib arms equal for the two different arms, and also importantly, the fact that those differences remain the same from the 12-month mark to the five-year mark without any evidence of closing up that difference. Deeper levels of MR4.5 were also observed at five years, which was achieved in about half of all the patients on each of the nilotinib arms, compared to 31% for the patients on the imatinib group. A benefit with nilotinib was observed across all so-called risk groups. The five-year overall survival for the nilotinib arms was 93.7% in the 300 twice a day, and 96.2 in the 400 twice a day, compared to 91.7 in the imatinib arm. And the five-year probability of progression-free survival was 92.2 for the nilotinib 300 twice a day, 95.8 for the 400 milligrams twice a day of nilotinib, and 91% for the imatinib 400 milligrams daily. In conclusion for the NSTND, at five years of follow-up, the rates of event-free survival, progression-free survival, and overall survival are not significantly different in the two treatment arms, particularly imatinib and the standard dose for frontline nilotinib, which is 300 twice daily. Nilotinib demonstrated, however, higher rates of early and deeper molecular responses, including MR4.5. By five years, more than half of the nilotinib-treated patients had achieved MR4.5, a key eligibility criterion for many treatment-free remission studies that are now starting to emerge. Basutinib, an oral dual SARC and ABLE kinase inhibitor, is another second-generation agent that has been tested in newly diagnosed CML patients. In the BELLA study, basutinib at a dose of 500 milligrams daily was tested against imatinib at the standard dose of 400 milligrams daily in newly diagnosed chronic phase CML patients. At 12 months, basutinib did not demonstrate a superior rate of complete cytogenetic response compared to imatinib, with the rates being 70% and 68% respectively, and this was the primary endpoint. However, there was a superior major molecular response rate of 41% compared to imatinib 27%. The two-year results are now available from this study. These results show that the cumulative rate of complete cytogenetic response were similar, with posutinib 79% and imatinib 80%, and the cumulative rates of major molecular response were also similar between the two treatment groups. You can see here that the rate at 24 months of major molecular response cumulatively is 59% for posutinib and 49% for imatinib. The early responses, that is, again, the bcr able transcripts less than 10% at three months, were associated with a better probability of eventually achieving a complete cytogenetic response or a major molecular response at 12 or 24 months in both arms. As a result of the trials such as decision and an SND, second generations agents, dasatinib and nilotinib, are now Category 1 NCCN recommendations for first-line therapy in patients with chronic phase, newly diagnosed chronic myeloid leukemia. Next, we will discuss what happens when first-line therapy ceases to be effective and look at the role of TKI therapy in the second-line setting. Welcome back. In this final segment, I am going to turn to what happens when first-line treatment fails in CML patients and what our options are for subsequent lines of therapy. The European Leukemia Net, or ELN, has published definitions of what is considered optimal response, what is considered warning, and importantly, what is considered treatment failure. As you can see on this table, this depends on two important factors the level of response, and the timing of the response. So for example, at three months, ideally we want to have 10% or lower transcript levels of bcr able or a major cytogenetic response with 35% or less Philadelphia positive metaphases. That would be considered an optimal response. If you have more than 95% of Philadelphia chromosome positive metaphases, that's a failure. 
and anything in between would be considered a warning. When monitoring patients, these criteria are very useful as early as three months. Thereafter, we should continue to assess responses every three to six months. We also need to monitor patients for any signs of resistant disease, such as the appearance of new symptoms, etc. So we need to discuss next, how do we go about selecting second-line therapy? The confirmation of certain BCR-able mutations may help us to guide the choice of TKIs in the second-line setting. This slide summarizes several mutations that may be overcome by selecting a specific TKI. Because of the sensitivity of the different mutations, the presence of one of these mutations can guide you to select one specific TKI. For example, you see mutations that are uh, considered sensitive to, for example, nilotinib, F317L, V, I, or C, or T315A, or V299L, you would probably select nilotinib. For T315I, the only one of the TKIs that we have available today that works against this mutation is ponatinib, so that would be the treatment of choice. Omacetaxin is a drug that is not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and therefore is potentially not affected by the presence of any mutation. So when do we screen for resistant mutations in a patient with CML? The current recommendations tell us that if at three months a patient has not achieved a complete hematologic response, or at six months a patient has not achieved at least a minor cytogenetic response, or at 12 months the patient has not achieved a major cytogenetic response, or at 18 months the patient has not achieved a complete cytogenetic response, we should check for mutations, or if at any point the patient loses a response that they have previously achieved, we should also look for a mutation. Earlier, I discussed therapeutic milestones in the first-line setting. In the second-line setting, we see similar benchmarks. In this slide, you see how the overall survival and the event-free survival is affected by the achievement of a cytogenetic response at three months. Patients that have at least a minor cytogenetic response at three months have a significantly better probability of overall survival, which is 100% in this case, and progression-free survival, 89.5%, compared to patients that have not yet achieved at least a minor cytogenetic response, where the overall survival is only 76.8% at two years and 63.6% .6 for event-free survival at two years. Now that many options are available, the sequencing of TKIs depends on several factors, such as the choice of the initial agent, the patient's experience of adverse events on therapy, the timing of treatment failure, and the presence of BCR-able mutations. This table summarizes some of the recommendations from the NCCN. For example, if you started with imatinib, you have many more choices but second line. You can use tasatinib, nilotinib, or bosutinib, and then after that, you have many treatment options as well that you can use if the patient needs a third line or subsequent therapy. In contrast, if you started with a second generation TKI, you have perhaps fewer treatment options, both for the second line and for subsequent lines of therapy. Although there are certain adverse events specific to the TKIs we have been discussing, certain toxicities may be common to the class. These include myelosuppression, transaminase elevations, and electrolyte changes. What are the recommended dosing and selected safety management suggestions with second generation TKIs? For the satinib, the standard dose in the chronic phase is 100 milligrams daily, orally, with or without meals. It is important to monitor patients for fluid retention, importantly looking for pleural effusions, pulmonary heart artery hypertension, and arterial thrombotic events. We should consider dose modifications and treatment interruptions and other strategies to manage uh, adverse events such as fluid retention and bleeding and importantly, manage comorbidities. For nilotinib, the standard dose is 300 milligrams twice daily when treating patients with newly diagnosed disease and 400 milligrams twice daily when using it as a second line therapy. This should be taken approximately 12 hours apart and on an empty stomach. Patients should be monitored carefully for fluid retention and particularly for arterial thrombotic events and hyperglycemia. 
For prosutinib, the standard dose is 500 milligrams orally, once daily, with food, and patients should be monitored for diarrhea and liver toxicities. For any patient with CML on therapy with TKIs, appropriate adherence counseling should also be part of any treatment plan, including the use of dosing calendars and other tools that can promote compliance with oral medications. I hope you have enjoyed this program and found it useful and informative. In conclusion, it is clear that excellent outcomes are possible with first and second generation TKIs as initial therapy in chronic phase CML, but that faster, deeper responses are possible with second generation agents such as dasatinib and ilotinib compared to imatinib. In addition, accurate monitoring for response and the potential development of disease resistance at important time points is critical for ensuring the efficacy of TKI therapy and for appropriate TKI sequencing in the second line setting and beyond. Thanks again for joining me in this discussion. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash awf. This activity is supported through educational grants from Bristol-Myers Squibb and Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation.